Welcome to What's on Tap with Mayari. My name is Mayari, and today we are going to be talking about food pairing. Very elusive, very mysterious. Hopefully today we can break it down and make it more simple, make it something that you can take home and make your own and just really have a lot of fun with it. So the first thing that we're going to talk about when it comes to food pairing is what are you pairing your food with? Are you doing cocktails? Are you doing beer? Are you doing wine? All right, so let's start with wine and we'll work our way into the other drinks that are available to us in this vast, vast world of beverages. All right, so let's say you are pairing wine with whatever you got going on. What I would like to recommend for you to do, obviously you do whatever you wanna do, but what I would suggest is these kind of three, these three categories on how to pair your food with. So if we're going to be talking about tewa, don't at me if I'm saying that wrong. It's definitely not terrier. It is spelled T-E-R-R-O-I-R. And so this is a French word for basically meaning things of one place stick together. You know that saying like birds of a feather flock together? Okay, it's kind of like that except we're talking about food and we're talking about the flora and fauna of a place, right? So if the grapes are growing in the south of France, then the animals that are there, the, the game and the vegetation that's there, all those things would go together because they all were born together, right? So we can pair this way. I would say a lot of like restaurants and establishments tend to pair this way. They're like, oh, we're a French restaurant, so we're gonna have a whole bunch of French wine. This makes sense. Um, And so basically when they do that, it makes it difficult to pair the wrong food together, right? Because if everything is from the same area, then they all have the same flavors. Cool, all right, so we can do that. I like to use I statements, so maybe this will help you. So if you're gonna base your food off of terroir, okay, I am making French food, I would like to buy a French wine. This is how you can like communicate this, you know, to whatever. If you're going to like a wine store, whatever, this will help you out and narrow all your selections down. All right, so now the second way that you can try to pair food is the food based. So for our I statement, I am making chicken. What goes with that? This shifts the focus of all 8 billion wines that are out there in the store to, I only want the stuff that goes with chicken. And now you're just deciding, do I want red, white, sparkling, rosé, frizzante? No, (laughs) I won't stress you out. But, you know, this is kind of where we're narrowing our choices down. So if I am making chicken, I'm making lemon rosemary chicken, I want a wine that goes with that. This is a way easier way to go talk to the people at the wine store or whatever the brewery, wherever you're going and make your selections. If you're doing this yourself, a lot of times websites will have like cool filters and you can just filter it out. Um, And again, you can just filter this based on what you like. So if you know that you enjoy white wines, boom, easy. I like chicken, I'm making chicken, I'm making lemon rosemary chicken i want something that goes with that okay i would probably suggest to you like a german white wine um, or like a riesling or something like that those tend to have like lemony citrus flavors uh sauvignon blanc quick tip sancerre and sauvignon blanc are the same grape it's the same thing it's just that sancerres are from france sauvignon blancs are from everywhere else (laughs) okay so the another major difference is the sancerres do tend to have more Hmm, crisp citrus flavors and apple flavors where Sauvignon Blancs from all over the world, you know, California, New Zealand, all of those places tend to be like a grassy. So there's a really popular one called like Oyster Bay. It's a very popular Sauvignon Blanc and it's, I believe it's from New Zealand or Australia. Anyways, the point of me telling you that is that to me that tastes like grass. So if that's your jam, or maybe you really like IPAs or something like that, that right, that might really fit with what you are looking for. And again, if you're making a super herbal fish or a really herbal chicken dish, these things go together. Okay, so that's like the food-based way of trying to pair food. And so the last way, again, this is my personal list. There's charts and diagrams that you can find online. I think that's very stressful, so... That's why I'm giving you these ones here. 
Um, and so the final way is wine based. So let's say um, for some you just happen to have like, oh, I have this really cool rosé. Um, what should I make with it? So this is like the wine based way. Okay, so it helps if you've had this particular wine like multiple times so you really know the flavor. So let's say you're having a rosé and it's like a dry rosé and it's a little bit like astringent as I find most of them to me. Um, then you can say to yourself, huh, I want something that's a little bit fatty. So like a fatty fish goes with, or a fatty dish, so like, um, you know, like if you're having a pork chop and it has all the little fat on it, like that's bacon, those kinds of things, avocados and lots of butter and olive oil, those things go with more high astringent wines, high tannin wine. Okay, so tannins is that astringency feeling that you get in your mouth and that's going to cut through the fat, making you want to eat more, want to drink more because the marriage of food and beverages is about making you want to do the other one again. It's about wanting to repeat the process. It's not about like making all of the flavors taste the same or, or it's, it's none of that. Um, contrast is good. Contrast is what gives us um, excitement. It gives us like, ah, I just had this sip of rosé and it was kind of dry. I want to eat more smoked salmon, right? And now we're eating and we're drinking and the whole thing is coming together and then all your food is gone and you're like, what happened? That means that that was a good pairing. So if you are drinking something and eating something and it's not making you want to do that, that's not a great pairing. And it's not that those two things don't necessarily taste good together. I think sometimes the general kind of consensus is that they have to taste good together to be a good pairing, but that's not really what we're like. Obviously, yes, you want it to taste good. You don't want it to taste bad, but what really makes it a great pairing is that back and forth play that's happening between you and your food. That's really what we're working. That's what we're working towards here. So hopefully that kind of clarifies um, the complicated world of food pairing. I think we had mentioned before that Food pairing is also really difficult because it's about your brain chemistry. So what I might smell and what might taste to me like grass, like that oyster bay we were just talking about, the Sauvignon Blanc, to someone else, they're like, oh, this tastes like lemons and pears. And I'm like, okay, like you do you, and I'm going to go have something else, right? And that's fine. So don't be stressed about food pairing. <laughs> I found I, I get asked a lot of questions about it, and I think people are really stressed out, um, especially because there's a lot of like articles and narratives about you have to have Cabernet with steak. And if you don't have Cabernet with steak, you're doing it wrong. That's not true. <laughs> you're not doing anything wrong. But the reason that that pairing is common is because Cabernet is like a bold, astringent wine. It's very dry. Um, and so when you're eating a nice, delicious steak, right, it has to be like a T-bone or a porterhouse. It can't be like a skirt steak. Those two things are not friends. But if you're eating something fatty like that, it makes you mm, eat a little bit, drink a little bit, eat a little bit, drink a little bit. And now we're having a good time. Now the next thing is kind of like a little sidebar in between wine-based for how to pair your food, and that's the tannin level. So again, the tannins is the astringentness <laughs> of the wine. And again, high fat foods go great with high, with high tannin wine, high astringency wines. Okay, those two things are friends. Now, another pairing that is kind of not well known, but definitely something to have in your back pocket is sweet wines go really great with spicy foods. So a lot of people, they're like, oh, you can't pair wine with everything, you know. Oh, it doesn't go with spicy foods. What about, you know, what about chilies? Okay, well, chilies go great with high sugar wines. So that would be like a, a really well-made Riesling. They're super fruity and very sweet on the palate. Now, sweetness doesn't mean that there's a whole bunch of sugar in there. It can if it's a fortified wine. But when we say sweetness, we're meaning more like there's low tannins, there's low acidity, and there's high fruit flavor. So that's what we mean. So again, spicy foods and sweet foods, sweet wines, go great together. Okay, 
Side note. Now, if you're pairing other stuff like beer, cocktails, beer deserves its own its own segment and its own show on pairing because as you may or may not know, there's millions of styles of beer and there's millions of flavors of beer that you could come up with every single day. New craft brewers are coming out with all these different combinations and they're coming up with, you know, pale ales with, you know, strawberries and all of this stuff. So there's a lot to work with. So I find pairing beer and food to be a little bit easier and there's a lot less pressure. No one's like stressed out about pairing beer and food together. Um, but I have a resource for you. So this is um, a great book if you love beer and you want to know more about put like that specifically. Um, this book is called The Brewmaster's Table. It is by Garrett Oliver. And he's the brewmaster of the Brooklyn Brewery. And he made this amazing book. And right in the end, it's a whole chart. And like it goes in alphabetical order. And it says, Beer with Food. A reference chart. So for all of my chart fans, I highly recommend. Um, this one is fantastic. I use this often. Um, I have like stuff highlighted and underlined everywhere, but it, it's everything from like asparagus to apple pie. So if you're really looking for the beer food experience, this book is amazing. I definitely recommend. And like I said, it goes through each thing like eggs, empanadas, enchiladas right there's like a whole bunch of stuff in there um so yes beer doesn't have as much pressure but there are still some things that you want to be aware of so uh for certain styles let's say you're doing like an ipa those tend to have a lot of hops and hops add that bitterness the astringency all that kind of stuff to the beer so if you're doing like a new england ipa or a regular ipa whatever um, again, you might want something a little bit more fatty and you probably don't want to do spices with that as in like hot spices, like red pepper flakes or anything like that. Those two things, it's like, have you ever had like a slice of pizza and you put red pepper flakes on it and you eat it and you're like, this is great. And then you try to drink some soda and you're like, what's that? <laughs> that's horrible, right? Okay. So <laughs> that's kind of the same vibe that you'll probably get trying to do an IPA with something spicy, but trying to do an IPA with something fatty and fatty doesn't have to mean like protein meat based, right? Fatty could be like, it has a lot of butter or it has a lot of, uh, olive oil. The higher astringency would play better with those things. Um, and there's a lot of stuff in between, you know, wheat beers. I think we mentioned that in like another episode is my favorite because they're soft and they're kind of creamy. And I personally think they go with everything, but that's just because I like them. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot more flexibility, but like I said, if you're looking for like specific stuff and you're trying to have a beer dinner, I highly recommend checking this book out. The, the whole chart, it's going to blow your mind. It's, it's great. Um, so Hopefully you guys are feeling good about wine and beer. I know I didn't give you as many specifics with beer, but hopefully, you know, you're feeling good about it. Um, and so the last thing I wanted to talk about was cocktails. So we didn't get a chance to talk too much about like spirits. Um, and that's because they're their own little world of yeast and things coming together and much more higher alcohol plays a major role in flavor and food pairing in the sense that something like a gin. Uh, gin is very botanical, right? So I think it's important to also say that spirits started out medicinal. Spirits were made to help people recover from illnesses. They were made to give people immune system boosts. It's basically made to heal people and like get people to feel better and to relieve pain and all of these types of things. So, you know, this idea of like a uh, of like cinnamon flavored rum or something like that is it's very new and it's very much geared towards like our flavor set like our our, our palates and not so much about like healing <laughs> healing the sick anymore we have we have different methods for that now um but so gin for example is a whole bunch of botanicals you know juniper berries and all of these like interestingly scented things and it's made different in different countries so if you go to like your local liquor store you might see like a 
you know, two different brands, and one of them might be British, and so these British gins are, um, it kind of reminds me of, like, a flower, like, baby powder or something like that. Like, that's kind of, like, the nose on it. And then if you move to a gin made maybe, like, in Japan or in Spain, those tend to be more, like, citrus fruity or more floral in the sense of, like, roses or something like that that's because it's their special like medicinal blend of herbs for that country so that's why these different spirits from different places are kind of vastly I don't know what the word like they're just like vastly differentiating and so if you like you know British gin you might not like Japanese or Spanish it just you know the flavors are very very different uh, but I bring that up because trying to pair, you know, like a gin with food is, it's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult. And that's why we make cocktails, right? And we make, we add grapefruit juice and lime juice and all of this other stuff to round out and highlight the flavors that we want. Um, and so the only thing that I would say if you're really like, I really only drink cocktails and like, I want to pair them with my food. Okay, cool. The first thing is determining, is this like an herbal-based spirit or is this like a sugar-based spirit? Because we have like our rums, which is straight up made from sugar cane. Then we have meads, which is made from honey. And I guess meads are a little bit more like beer, but whatever, we're gonna add them into our, our spirit category. Um, then, you know, you like you have your gins and you have your whiskeys, right? And so all of these things have such their flavors are so different, like a Scottish, you know, whiskey versus an Irish whiskey versus an American bourbon. Those three things taste so different. There's no way that you could be like, all whiskeys go with beef, right? That's just, <laughs> it just doesn't really make sense, especially if you have like a peated whiskey, which is that moss that they take and they infuse it into the whiskey making process. It's very herbal. It's very smoky. It's not for everybody. Um, and you know, it's not going to go with like your regular kind of like steak dinner. It just, it, those two things aren't friends. Um, so spirits are a little bit more difficult. I, okay. So I have a book, I have a book for you, um, to make it more fun. So this is my second book. Um, this is the craft of the cocktail by Dale. De Groff. I hope I said your name right, Dale. Um, so this book is great. And basically what it has is it kind of takes you through like a mini journey of, you know, fortified wines, right? Fortified wines are in a lot of cocktails, uh, sherries, vermouths. Vermouth is a fortified wine, um, you know, and it has all these nice little blurbs. You know, tequila is made from the agave plant, right? So it's very sweet. Um, it's like next to rum, far away from whiskey. <laughs> the, those two things are so different. Whiskey is actually very close to beer and its process. It's like made with barley and it has the water, it has the yeast. They're very close and then all of a sudden they, they separate at the end. Um, so I recommend this book here. It's a great, like not super long, right to the point, you know, like blurbs on all of your different spirits and all your different alcohols. And then... It has this even better thing where it has all the different cocktail recipes. And these are like standard recipes that like every super amazing bartender knows. Um, so I highly recommend this um, for people who are just more interested in spirits and cocktails and like learning more about that world. There's a lot to learn. I also recommend the TV show Drink Masters on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen it. It's great and they make these really cool cocktails and drinks it's like a night bar setting and they get judged it's awesome so yeah it's on netflix check it out if you're interested in cocktails um and they do they do there's just so much to learn from these people who have dedicated so much time to making cocktails and like being in that nightlife and seeing what people like it's it's really cool so those are my two recommendations for cocktails and for beer. Yeah, so just take your time, find out what you enjoy, find out what 
what it is you're basing it off of. Find a center point. Any, anytime you're trying to pair food, just find your center point. Am I focused on the wine? Am I focused on the food? Or am I trying to make birds of a feather flock together? And that will that will give you a nice solid starting point. And that's really all that food pairing is. Everyone has their, you know, charts and diagrams and processes, but those are very specific. So yeah, just have fun with it. Have a good time. Eat, drink, be merry. Thank you for watching What's on Tap with Mayeti. And we'll be back next time to talk about more food and wine stuff.